I have you loud and clear. <laughs> Hello. 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 Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Science. And that is to say, physics, medicine, nature, space, time, brain, life, the universe. This week we're turning the lights down low in the search for darkness. 80% of Europeans and North Americans now can't see the Milky Way. We'll be delving into the issue of light pollution to find out why and whether it even matters. Plus, in the news, with the US presidential elections fast approaching, we see what we can learn from animals when it comes to picking the best leader. And do you really lose most of your heat through your head? I'm Kat Arney. I'm Chris Smith, and you're listening to The Naked Scientist. The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by UKfast.co.uk. Now, first this week, in what embryologists everywhere are hailing as a scientific tour de force, Japanese researchers announced that they have successfully turned skin cells into egg cells, which are capable of being fertilised and giving rise to healthy young mice. Previously, this had been achieved only by implanting stem cells into the ovaries of living animals. This new breakthrough, on the other hand, was achieved completely external to the body using a cell culture system. Dushko Illich is a stem cell biologist at King's College London. He wasn't involved in this piece of research, but I asked him to take me through what Katsuhiko Hayashi, who's the author of the new study, has done. This is a Japanese group that works for a long time on this problem, and the problem is how you can make eggs in laboratory using stem cells. Now, why is that an intractable or long-standing problem? Why can't we do that? We don't know enough about it. To make eggs or sperm is one probably the most complicated Puzzles. And what have this group actually done that means that we are a further step down the road? So several years ago, they published first report in which they used uh, cells from mouse tail, they fiddled with them in some way, revert them to embryonic state, and then they took those cells and put in mouse ovaries or mouse testes. And those that put in mouse ovaries, after a month, they become eggs. In this report, they didn't use live animals. They took uh, just ovary, put in the dish, and put together with stem cells, and they got uh, eggs. So just by taking a stem cell, by putting that in the right sort of milieu, the right environment, an ovary or ovarian tissue, this is what triggers those stem cells to then turn into egg-like cells again. Exactly, that is correct. So before they had to put in ovary, but now they figure out that how to keep the tissue in dish. And so in right environment, cells know what to do. What is the nature of the signal then? Or why do you think that putting these stem cells into the environment of cells that you would find in an ovary, why is that sufficient to make these stem cells then turn into some kind of, of egg-like cell? Because ovary is not made only from eggs, there are different cell types, and so they secrete different factors. They give signals and tell their neighbors to do. So it is like like small, tight, knit environments, like village. So they know what they to do and influence each other. And this influence is in the correct direction to make these stem cells turn into eggs. But are the eggs that are produced this way? viable? In other words, are they not just looking like eggs? Can they behave like eggs and be fertilised by a sperm cell? In this report, they show that it's possible. They got from certain percentage of eggs, they got uh, live pups. Right. And were those pups themselves potentially fertile? Or have they not done that experiment yet to show that it's not just one generation you can make, you are actually making fertile offspring? They didn't do this experiment yet, but uh, pups look fine, they look healthy, and they show that they can make uh, from those eggs also embryonic stem cell lines. So seeing everything seems to be okay and in place. And why is this important? Why should we hail this as a breakthrough, if indeed we should? I think we should. There is two different very important issues around. So first, this will help us to study and understand and find how to treat infertility cases in humans. Secondly, we may help to revive endangered animal species. Because we could potentially take an adult cell from the animal we want to conserve, and even if it's male, 
you could presumably, with the right culturing, you could turn that into egg cells from a male. Absolutely. So from male, you, it, it has to be male because male have X and Y chromosomes, female and male chromosomes, so they can give eggs and sperm. From female, you can get only eggs, so there would be a problem. Well, given this success story then, what are the outstanding questions that you as a specialist in this area would like to see answered before you're comfortable that A, this is working the way they say it's working, and B, that we could consider extrapolating this onto, say, a human? I don't think that we should uh, rush toward extrapolating to humans. So there is a lot of things to answer yet. First, if you're working with humans, how you can get uh, human ovarian tissue. So we have to first go to the next step, which means culturing and understanding how to direct stem cells to make eggs or sperm without any other tissue in the culture present. And that would take probably years. Only after that we can see how it works, not only in mice, maybe in other animals. So it will take years before we can even consider about humans. Impressive nonetheless, though, isn't it? That was Dusko Illich commenting on that study, which was published this week in the journal Nature, and it was worked by Kyushu University's Katsuhiku Hayashi. Leukaemia is a cancer of the blood, and it's also the most common form of cancer in children. But like all cancers, leukemic cells can become resistant to the chemotherapy that's used to control them. And scientists had thought that one of the ways cells become resistant is by hiding themselves away in the recesses of the bone marrow and going into a state of suspended animation, placing them beyond the reach of a drug attack. Now, Christina Lo Celso has discovered that these cells are actually highly active and mobile, as she explained to Kirsten Gopfrick, beginning with why chemotherapy doesn't always work. It actually works pretty well and it really gets rid of the bulk of the leukemia. We could see mice completely riddled with disease and within a few days of chemotherapy, we could see just very, very few cells left. Now, these very, very few cells left are really the problem because these are the cells that are then able to regenerate the disease. And because these cells are chemoresistant, it means that when a patient comes back to the clinic with a relapse, it is much, much harder to treat. Scientists had always thought that some leukemia cells were resistant to chemo because they went into hiding, possibly seeking refuge from their destroyer in the bone marrow. But when Christina started watching these cells, she found quite the opposite. And that was that these cells don't hide, and rather they run through the bone marrow fairly constantly. So it, it really was very surprising. And especially it is making us think about leukemia in a very different way. And it is making us think about completely different approaches to tackle leukemia survival. So how did you find out that there are these runner cells that run really fast after you treated the leukemia with chemotherapy? What we did was to work with a specific type of microscopy that we have developed over the years that allows us to see live cells inside the bone marrow of live anesthetized mice. And uh, we have single cell resolution, which for live imaging through bone, it's really quite of an achievement. And because we can see single cells, we can really see those very, very few cells that are able to survive chemotherapy. And not only we can see them, but we can follow them over time. So in some cases, we follow them for up to 14 hours. That was a long, long night in the lab. Um, but that really gave us an idea of how these cells behave over time. But how about leukemia in patients? How, how is that related to what happens in a human being? So this was a very important question for us, and we really wondered whether also the human cells would migrate, whether they would move. So what we did was to work with some specific mutant mice, which are very heavily immunocompromised, and we can inject human cells into these mice, and because the mice don't have a good immune system, they will not reject the human cells, and the human cells can develop into the leukemia in the same way as they develop in the patient. And so in order to identify the human cells, we injected antibodies that recognize human cells as opposed to mice. And these antibodies were fluorescent, so they would glow in the dark and they would tell us exactly, exactly where the human cells were. And we followed them over time and we saw that they were moving in the same way. Sounds like it is time to run after the running cells. Do you have any idea how to do this? 
Absolutely. Uh, it's definitely time to run after the runners. So we know that there are a number of genes that are important in regulating the movement of cells. And over the years, cell biologists have developed a number of inhibitors, which means a number of drugs that can be used to interfere with these motors. And so what we are planning on doing now is to start off from already existing drugs and see if we can apply them um, to improve the treatment of leukemia, at least in the murine models that we have available within the laboratory. Sort of like sleeping pills for cancer cells. Yes, or making them lazy. Wow, that's exciting. So what's next in the future? We have been able to collaborate with a number of clinicians and uh, these are fantastic links and we hope we'll be able to do a lot more work together in the future. So we're definitely going to be busy in the next few years. So let's chase up those leukemic cells. That was Imperial College's Christina Lo Celso and she published that work this week in the journal Nature. The idea that we can go to some kind of technique or technological expertise which will, you know, make the decision for us, that will be attractive to, to, to a good group of people. In this month's Naked Genetics, we're hearing more than ever about the secrets hidden in our genes, from our risk of diseases like cancer to traits such as sporting ability. But just because we can test for them, does that mean we should? Listen and download now at nakedscientist.com genetics. This is The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith and me, Kat Arney. Now, it's time for our regular myth conception, where we take scientific dogma to task. And this week, Kat, you've been getting hot over rather than under the collar. If you are listening to The Naked Scientist here in the UK, you've probably noticed that it's getting chillier. The nights are drawing in, the heating's going on, and you're busy raiding the wardrobe for gloves, scarves and, of course, a nice warm hat. That's because we've all been told that we lose anywhere between half and 90% of our body heat through our heads, depending on who you listen to. Well, it turns out you shouldn't listen to anyone telling you that, because it simply isn't true. It's hard to pin down exactly where this myth arose, but apparently the US Army Field Manual claims that 40 to 45% of body heat is lost through the head. This is probably the result of early military experiments exposing people to very cold temperatures while wearing various warm and cosy garments. As you might expect, if you're all bundled up with your head exposed, you're going to lose most of your heat up top. But it does make sense. You'll only be warmer with a hat on if the rest of you is also wrapped up. If you're wandering around in the buff with nothing but a bobble hat on, you can expect some funny looks. And also, that hat won't keep you warm. So, just how much heat is actually lost through the head compared to the rest of the body? Well, for a start, we need to think about the shape, and more specifically, surface area to volume ratio. We know from physics that smaller and thinner things with a high surface area to volume ratio will lose heat more quickly than bigger, rounder things. The head is more or less spherical, which is a kind of shape that retains heat well, unlike thinner, flappier bits, like your hands and feet. And it only makes up around 7% of the surface area of the body. Also, just to complicate the issue, people have different amounts of hair on their heads, which acts as an insulator. To try and figure out how this all fits together, a Canadian researcher called Thea Pretorius started dunking unlucky volunteers in chilly pools, with or without their heads sticking out into the warmer air. She discovered that dunking the head in the water too only increased heat loss by about 10%, suggesting that heat loss from the head is roughly proportional to the rate at which it's lost from other parts of the body. But there is a twist. She's also found that the rate at which the core temperature cools down is similar if the whole body, minus the head, is cooled down or if only the head is cooled. Intriguingly, cooling the body triggers a shivering reaction which helps to warm you up, while cooling just the head doesn't. So while it's not strictly true that we lose more heat through our heads, having a cold head does cool down the rest of your body. In fact, a cold head increases core cooling by nearly 40%. So it's not so much keeping the heat in by wearing a hat on your head that keeps you toasty as stopping the cold air getting to your head that makes a difference. What's more, making sure you keep your hands and feet warm with socks and gloves will definitely make a difference too, as these are thinner body parts that lose heat more rapidly than something solid and spherical like your head. So, as the temperature drops this winter, use science, rather than hearsay, to keep you warm and cosy. 
and I find a stiff drink and a few logs on the fire goes a long way too. Thank you very much, Kat. And if you at home have a myth that you would like us to investigate, you can email it over to chris at thenakedscientist.com and we will subject it to our usual scrutiny. Are you of the opinion that supermarket fruits and vegetables just don't taste as good as the ones you can pick up in the local grocers? If so, science may be on your side, because new research out this week in the journal PNAS has shown that refrigerating tomatoes reduces their flavour. Greer Jackson caught up with the study's author, Denise Tiemann. Well, I've always loved tomatoes. As a child, they were my favourite food. I started doing research in plant science, and I soon fell into a lab that worked on tomato flavour. Because your latest paper is all about keeping tomatoes tasty, but I wonder, was there a moment when you were like, tomatoes just aren't as tasty as they used to be? Yes, that was some of our previous research, actually. So we know that modern tomatoes don't taste as good as some of the older varieties, what we call heirloom varieties. A lot of our previous research was trying to define what really makes a tomato taste good. And we tested many, many varieties of tomatoes. We had people taste them. And then we looked at the biochemistry of those tomatoes and tried to figure out what really would be the recipe for a perfect tomato. Mm -hmm. And what did you find? What is the perfect recipe? Well, it's a complicated mix of many things. The main components of tomato flavor are sugar, acids, and aroma compounds. And we find that we need a base of sugars and acids, but the aroma compounds are really what make a tomato a tomato. And it's the chilling of tomatoes that dampens these aromas and you've been looking at how this is happening. Yes, so they're often chilled by the supermarkets, by the producers and we found, well it's been known that chilling tomatoes makes them taste bad so what we did was we looked at what was actually happening inside the tomato after the chilling. And what was happening? Um, Basically the sugars and acids I was talking about, they are not changed with chilling, but you lose a lot of the aroma compounds, so the tomato tastes bland, it doesn't have that tomato flavor. And so what we did was we looked at actually what was happening at a genetic level, and we found that with extensive chilling, about a week of chilling, the genes that make these aroma compounds are shut off. These genes are responsible for making enzymes, which in turn synthesise something called volatile chemicals. To you and me, that's just tasty aromas. And when they're chilled, the mechanism used by cells to control genes are turned off. In this case, it seems forever. They don't recover. They won't be turned back on again if you bring it back to room temperature. There's a trade-off then, and I suppose many might choose to eat bland tomatoes and reduce food waste, especially given that most of us never normally eat them on their own. Which begs the question, does this finding really matter, or is there something else going on here? For instance, could taste indicate the levels of nutrients within a tomato? Well, that's another thing, you know, and there's been some theories as far as that's concerned. A lot of these aroma compounds are actually kind of cues for different nutritional compounds. For instance, they come from carotenoids like lycopene and beta carotene that, you know, everybody tells us is good for us now. And some of them come from amino acids, which we also need. And some of them come from lipids, which we need. So a lot of them do seem to come from compounds that are actually very nutritious for us. So it could be the case, and I suppose this might apply to other fruits as well that supermarkets are chilling? Yes. Uh, Tomatoes are especially susceptible to chilling injury, but other fruits and vegetables also are. Maybe not to quite the extent the way they lose so much flavor as tomato, but they do see the same thing happening with other fruits and vegetables. Now that you sort of know on a genetic level what's going on, does that mean we can somehow use this and have tasty tomatoes that also last a sufficient amount of time? Well, that's what we hope. Now that we actually know what's happening, maybe we can find uh, tomatoes, older varieties of tomatoes, that might be less susceptible to this chilling. And so if we can find those, then we can go back and breed those traits into the modern tomatoes and hopefully prevent some of this loss of flavor with chilling. Denise Tiemann and her tasty tomatoes from the University of Florida. Now, what makes a good leader? Connie Orbach reports. I want to welcome you to the first presidential debate. The participants tonight are Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Choosing a leader can be a long and complicated affair, with lots of stages, rules and traditions. 
The 90-minute debate is divided into six segments, each 50 minutes long. We'll explore three topic areas tonight, achieving prosperity, America's direction, and securing America. And it will often involve millions of people voting en masse based on information gleaned from months of campaigns. It's far from simple, but humans are not the only animals to elect leaders. So when it comes to choosing positions of power, how do we match up? I asked Marta Manser from the University of Zurich to talk me through what the animals do. Either it's being the strongest or being the most clever, having the best knowledge. But usually it's not just an easy way to become the leader. But once you are the leader, then it might not take that much to really suppress the others and to accept you as leader. Only if you show weaknesses, the other group members might try to overrule you and take that position. And why is it that within these groups they're so happy to follow one leader? Why would you make that decision? It's probably the least energetic way. If I uh, always have to make decisions and I have to convince the other individuals to follow that decision, I, I have to invest quite a lot of energy. And I think also in humans that's probably very similar as long as that's the much easier way than to invest a lot of uh, input time and energy, we are quite happy to follow other individuals. Animals will often choose the easiest option. If they can use less energy following someone else than making their own decisions, well, all the better. It's definitely quicker, but not particularly rigorous. Us humans would surely know that the loudest in the group isn't necessarily the best. If you have a group of uh, humans, of individuals, and uh, you tell them they should just try to be in the group, but you tell one of those people a specific information, for example, they should go to the location in the north, that individual should then obviously try uh, to lead the rest of the group and tries to, to make the way up north. And because of that individual ha has a specific uh, aim, it probably behaves quite dominant. It's very determined. It's going in that direction. The rest of the other people they don't have a goal, so they just follow the most obvious determined individual. And we find that in humans, we find that in meerkats, we find that in fish. So that's a very common occurrence in, in the animal kingdom. So when thinking about something like a presidential election, it might be the person that shouts loudest and longest might tempt us. Yeah, well, exactly. I think uh, in elections like that, it's the emotions that count. And then really, if you are the most convincing by being the loudest, by behaving very obvious, a lot of people might just follow that. They might not look what the content of that person really is. They might just follow the most obvious signs. Oh dear, maybe we're not as diligent as we thought. But no worries. If recent UK politics has taught us anything, when we're unhappy with our leader, we can always attempt to coup. Jeremy Corbyn has lost the confidence of eight out of ten Labour MPs and has been hit by as many as 60 resignations from his front bench team. He looks set to face a leadership challenge, but Mr Corbyn says he won't betray his supporters by resigning. And we're not alone in that either. As Oxford University's Isabel Watts found out, pigeons will form a coup of their own. When a leader of a pigeon flock had incorrect information, Instead of the information being passed straight down the hierarchy and therefore the whole flock taking an incorrect route, which could be very detrimental, that the hierarchy was actually able to reorganise itself and therefore the leader bird was no longer at the front and therefore its information was no longer as key to the flock's decision making. And therefore actually the flock were able to fly the same route as they had flown in training without taking in this incorrect information. And this was quite a key result, and it showed that the hierarchy, although being very stable, is actually a flexible system, and that they can use this flexibility in situations where the performance of the whole flock would suffer if it was inflexible. Desperate times calls for desperate measures. When they know that their leader is possibly going to cause problems for everyone, they can, let's say, relegate that leader and put them further yeah. down the pecking order. And how do you send a pigeon in the wrong direction in the first place? We use a process called clock shifting. And clock shifting essentially jet lags birds, so it causes them to have a faulty compass. 
And what you can do is basically place the birds in a light tight room for a few days where you can turn the lights on and off at times shifted compared to real sunrise and sunset. And therefore you can reset their internal body clocks to become shifted. And this means once they're released, they'll misinterpret the sun's position by a predictable magnitude. So this means that by just clock shifting the leaders, we can create birds that have incorrect navigational information compared to the rest of the flock. And what if they don't want to lose their authority? What if your pigeon wants to remain a leader? Can they keep control of the pack? It's probably unlikely because I think if all the other birds want to, for example, fly right and the leader wants to fly left, the leader doesn't have much choice because either it flies alone or it thinks it's more important to fly as a flock, which is often the case for pigeons, and therefore I'll just follow. But... We don't exactly know the mechanism behind when the leader loses its leadership because either the leader could choose not to lead or the followers could choose not to follow. Well, there you have it. Even in politics, we're not that special. But when choosing our next leaders, let's make a pact to contain our animal instincts and try to look a little deeper. Connie Orbeck reporting and she was hearing from Oxford University's Isabel Watts and before her, Marta Mansa from the University of Zurich. This is The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith and with Kat Arney. As the sun sets here where we are, it's time to move on to the main theme of our show, the dark. But if you look up at the night sky, can you see the Milky Way? The fact is that as more of us become city dwellers, Light pollution is encroaching on all of our lives, and that means the 9,096 stars that you should be able to see with the naked eye are no longer visible for the majority of people, including 80% of Europeans and North Americans. But so what? A little bit of extra light's not going to hurt anyone, is it? Or is it? Well, in today's episode of The Naked Scientist, Chris and I are going to be shedding some light of our own on this issue. First up, how did we get into such a light-drenched nighttime world in the first place? Well, maybe it's because of our fear of the dark. Claire Jackson faces her demons and heads into the night to find out. You can't. Are you afraid of the dark? I used to think that witches would come and bite my toes off if I lay on my belly and hung my feet over the edge of the bed. The real kicker was that this was the most comfortable way to sleep. But where does this fear of the dark come from? It's impossible to say with any precision when our fear of the dark began. But certainly night was man's first necessary evil. That's Roger E. Kirch, historian from Virginia Tech. And you can see why it might be our first necessary evil. Picture this. You're a caveman, it's night time, and you're all tucked up with your furry skins, ready for sleep. <sighs> and then... What was that? You don't want to seem like a big Jesse, so you don't do anything. You just listen. Jeez, is that a... That's it. You're on high alert, except it's pitch black. You can't see a thing. So you listen all night long, praying for the sun to come up and that you won't get eaten alive. Your fear, initially at least, was what was in the dark. And then eventually your fear became of the dark itself. And this is an idea that Edmund Burke had. The famous philosopher and political theorist in the 18th century was of the opinion that our fear was inherent. But not all believe this to be true. John Locke's explanation was that there was no such inherent fear, that in fact children were told ghost stories in order to uh, get them to go to bed, in order to control them, and hence this fear was instilled. Uh, More recently, uh, psychologists have tried to bridge the gap 
they have speculated that uh, there was no innate fear of darkness at first, but naturally, uh, deprived of vision, at a time when predators roamed free, uh, men and women, if they did not fear dark at the outset, they nonetheless quickly came to associate it with perils of all sorts, both real and imagined. So that by the time of ancient civilizations, uh, virtually all associated darkness with demons, danger, and death. And this makes sense, since being safely tucked up in a bed in a house with locks and access to a light switch, we still fear the dark. Yet instead of wolves, bears and toe-biting witches, it's criminals and car accidents. But is there any evidence to suggest that there are more crashes and crooks at night time? I, I think it's incontestable, although there are some fierce opponents of light pollution, the prime association being the International Dark Sky Association, whose work I greatly admire. But to contend, as some members do, that there is no association between darkness and crime is poppycock, in my opinion. The same with automobile accidents. However, we have covered scientific research on the show that suggests precisely the opposite. Here's Rebecca Steinbeck from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine talking about her research she published last year. I played it to Roger too. We invited every local authority in England and Wales to give us information on uh, any changes that they had made to street lighting. And if they had made any changes to street lighting, what were the dates of those changes and what were the locations? And then we were able to use data from the police on uh, the locations and timings of road traffic casualties and crimes. And then we were able to model whether any changes in street lighting provision were associated with any changes in road traffic casualties or crimes. In the end, we were able to get data from 62 local authorities, which included over 25,000 kilometers of road where there had been some form of street lighting change, and we found no evidence that these were associated with increases in uh, road collisions or crimes. Where's your evidence, is what I'm trying to say, when clearly this study suggests that actually there isn't more crime associated, or road collisions even, with darkness? To that, I would say, for that one study, there are at least five or ten that contradicted. I would also say that it's a matter of common sense. Whether you're driving a car down a dark road that you do not know, or, in my case, walking in uh, Richmond, Virginia, a city with a very high rate of crime, it can be very, very dangerous. I was reassured by the fact that there was any number of street lamps. So in your opinion then, Roger, our fear of the dark is still justified? Yes. Oh, yes. To limit or in some cases entirely do away with street lamps would be, to my knowledge, the first example in human history whereby a widely used technology of proven merit had been rejected or constrained. Now, while Greer was talking with Roger E. Kirch, I've come outside to the car park, and I'm here with Paul Fellows. He's the chairman of the Cambridge Astronomical Association. First of all, Paul, what do you think of the state of our night sky? Well, sadly, um, we can't really see very much, and it's getting worse here in Cambridge and elsewhere in the country. The amount of light scattered up from all these artificial lights, the street lights, the office lights, cars, everything, is just hitting the, the sky and bouncing back to us. Can we actually see any stars? At this 
at this precise moment I've only just come outside but no I can't even if I look where I know they oh, ought to be. There's one, look you've... straight above your head. Oh yes you've spotted one before I did, that's Deneb in the constellation of Cygnus, well done. Have you ever seen the Milky Way? Oh yes definitely and we, we do see it on a good night here in Cambridge just right above your head at this time of year. It, near that star, actually, it goes through the constellation of Cygnus. But how old were you when you first saw it? Oh, I should think I was probably in my early teens, 13, something like that, when I first saw it. And I lived down in Portsmouth, which was a fairly big city, and you could see it then because the skies were so much darker. But not today? Not today, and very rarely here in Cambridge these days, unfortunately. I must admit, I probably had the same sort of epiphany that you did when you first saw it in your teens, but it took me until my late 20s. It wasn't till I went to Australia and was knocking around in the outback and staring up at this amazing sky and I suddenly realised what I'd been missing for almost the first three decades of my life. Yes, I had the same idea. I went up to the Isle of Arran in Scotland, off, off the coast, away from all the lights, and I was lost. I mean, I know my way around the stars, but there were so many, and the Milky Way went right from one horizon above my head over down to the other side, and I was speechless. Now, explain this to me. We've, we're surrounded by streetlights here, and we can look at the impact in terms of objective measurement of that in a minute, but why should a bit of light here on the ground make a difference for our ability to see stars up there in the black void? Well there's several reasons. Firstly the light leaks from where it's supposed to go. It uh, either goes directly straight up into the sky or it hits the ground and then bounces back up and is scattered all over the place. And then it hits the dirt and the dust and the particles in the air and is bounced back to us again so we see the sky as bright. It's not actually black. And the second reason is to do with our eyes. Our eyes accommodate to the darkness by the pupil opening up and by the chemistry in the eye adapting to be more sensitive. And it takes about 20 minutes in full darkness for that to happen. But if you don't have full darkness, it'll never happen. Your eyes, the pupils will stay small and uh, you won't see any faint objects at all. Well, I've brought a newspaper out uh, to see if I can read the newspaper. I thought I'd bring the sun, because that sounded suitably astronomical. So I can clearly hear, apparently, on this dark night, read every word on that page, certainly the headlines and even the smaller stuff. But, I mean, being able to read a newspaper under plain sight, that says quite a lot of light pollution, doesn't it? It does, really. And, of course, we're standing here and I can see you in colour, and that means the colour cells in my eyes are perfectly happy and the rods that, that do the real sensitive work are shut down. So we've got no chance of seeing anything faint like the Milky Way in the amount of light we've got here. How do we actually quantify the degree of light pollution? OK, well, um, there's a very useful scale called the John Bortle scale, invented in 2001. It runs from 9 to 1. So 1 is the best perfect conditions, which we just don't ever get in England, and 9 is the centre of London or some big city like that where you can really only see the brightest objects like the planets and the moon and maybe one or two of the brightest stars. Here in Cambridge we get about six which means we can occasionally see the Milky Way directly above our head and many hundreds of stars on a good night. If you go somewhere like the outback of Australia you might get down to a three or two and start to see other phenomena such as the zodiacal light which is actually dirt and dust in the plane of the solar system being illuminated by the sun and you see that just at the uh, horizons coming up in the plane of where all the planets are. Do you think in the grand scheme of things Paul this really matters as in we're not going to not do astronomy we can just go somewhere like you're saying where it is dark and do the astronomy does it really matter that we're polluting the night sky? Uh, I think there are a whole series of reasons uh, both astronomical and financial really we're wasting energy by ruining the night sky with all this stray light if somebody's paying the electricity bill to do that but from an astronomical point of view it's a great way that kids get into science I, I run the Cambridge Young Astronomers program and we have kids from 7 to 11 every Saturday once a month some of them have gone on to get their PhDs now it's it's a great way of getting kids into science is that what happened to you absolutely my first experience of looking at the night sky was with a small telescope that my dad brought home and we pointed it up at the sky and 
said, what's that object there? And wow, it was Saturn with its rings. So the next thing I did was build my own telescope, slightly bigger, actually bigger than I was at the time. And that led to a school prize and a trip to see Patrick Moore and uh, tea and telescopes at his house with the great man himself. Patrick Moore invited you over? Yes, yeah, so I, I went round, came bounding down the driveway in an old T-shirt and welcomed me, and I spent hours there sh- looking around all his uh, telescopes and observatories that he had in his garden in Selsey down on the south coast and uh, listening to him talk. It was fantastic. I was completely hooked. And I suppose in those days there wasn't too much light pollution, was there? No. Uh, even there he had a pretty good view. Paul, thank you very much. That's Paul Fellows. He's the chairman of the Cambridge Astronomical Association. On Naked Astronomy this month, with me, Greer Jackson, we've been going gaga for Gaia, the mission that's going to map the Milky Way in more detail than ever before. Find the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, whatever podcasting app you use. Just search for Naked Astronomy to find out what the fuss is all about. This is The Naked Scientists with Chris Smith and Kat Arney. And today we're turning the lights down low in the quest for darkness. Recently, an increasing body of research suggests that light is one of the key mechanisms involved in how our body clocks are regulated. So having a light on signals to your brain, wakey wakey, and delays sleep hormones. Essentially, we're living in a permanent state of mini jet lag. But it's not just any light. The colour of the light is important. Norway's Mary Heising from Uni Health Research in Bergen studies the effects of blue light emitted from your computer screens, televisions and smartphones. Many of these uh, screens have quite bright light and some of the blue light might impact your hormone production or the sleep hormone, so it actually sets your clock off a little bit. So in the same sense that being outside in the morning helps your sleep, having very bright light in the evening will probably delay your sleep pattern and making it harder for you to fall asleep at night. With halogen street lamps increasingly being replaced by LED lights, which emit a lot of blue light, this is a cause for concern, especially if you happen to have one of those lights shining through your bedroom window. This is because the blue light can disrupt your circadian rhythm, or body clock, as Dr John O'Neill from the MRC Laboratory for Molecular Biology has argued on the show previously. We know that circadian disruption, as occurs during shift work, for example, is really bad for you in the long term. So there's a very strong association with chronic diseases such as diabetes, neurodegenerative disorders. uh, Breast cancer. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. A load of different cancers. But this is referring to people who can, if they wish, shut out the light with curtains or blinds, or they just turn off the phone or the computer. But what about those individuals who can't? I'm referring, of course, to nocturnal animals that have spent millions of years evolving to live in the dark, and they're now confronted with light 24-7. What could be the cost to them? Bob Misen is the coordinator of the British Astronomical Association's Commission for Dark Skies, and he joins us now from Bournemouth. So, Bob, we've just heard a little bit about how light at night can be harmful for humans. Is this the same for animals? Verlin Klinkenberg in the National Geographic a few years ago said that we've invaded the night as if it were an unoccupied country. And in fact, nothing can be further from the truth. Every creature almost in the world has uh, evolved for millions of years to have a day and a night. And if we give them a day and a day, they're certainly not going to thrive. What sort of animals and, and how are they affected by this light at night? Well, most species in the world are nocturnal. It's a very good predator avoidance strategy, of course, being in the dark. And um, the bats and the moths, uh, owls, these are the ones that come to mind because they're the ones we tend to see. Fish, for example, are um, pretty thrown by light uh, on their water when when it's supposed to be night time. There was a famous case um, about 10 years ago in Stonehaven in Scotland when anglers were very put out that the fish were not rising to feed at night because the local tennis club was floodlighting their water. And (laughs) the fish's feeding, foraging habits were completely disrupted. Perhaps they starved, I don't know. 
I could see that would be a problem. And one of the animals we do think about a lot as, as coming out at night is bats. But there, there are impacts on birds as well as, as other flying species at night. What are some of the impacts on them? Yes, I mean, most birds, are, you know, we know a few nocturnal species, but most birds are diurnal. When they migrate, they very often fly very long distances. This goes into the night. Some American cities and Canadian cities are now turning off lights in tall buildings because birds, for reasons still not clear, will fly straight into lit windows. It's the Fatal Light Awareness Program, otherwise known as FLAP in Canada and America, which uh, highlights this problem. And they show on the internet, you can find pictures of literally thousands of birds that have died overnight hitting tall buildings. This is a problem indeed. Birds migrate partly by using the light cues of the stars and the moon and uh, we, we really shouldn't try to overpower those cues by shining mostly unnecessary lights. I mean, look at Canary Wharf at uh, one, 3 o'clock in the morning. Do all those lights really need to be on? I think that is an issue. What sort of cost is it to the economy and also to the environment from keeping all these lights on all the time when maybe they don't need to be? Um, I've uh, searched, trawled through many a website trying to find the cost of light pollution and uh, there are almost as many estimates as there are websites. But let me give you one example. There is a website from, I think it's the Slovenian Dark Sky Association and they claim that Europe as a whole spends 7 billion euros, that's not million, that's billion euros, every year lighting up the night sky. Wow, and presumably that's a huge amount of, of wasted carbon dioxide as well. Just it is. I mean, going you out. know, people say, oh, astronomers moaning about light pollution. But it's everybody's problem because it's your council tax being thrown away. It's money and energy that we really can't afford. So with the Commission for Dark Skies, what, what are you actually asking for? Should we just switch everything off at night oh, and no, go no, back no. to uh, completely <laughs> living in the dark? Absolutely not. No, we're not crazy. We don't want people to live in medieval darkness. Um, we want star quality lighting. We just want lights to shine where they're needed. I took a photo today of the latest uh, new light on the wall of my community centre here in Dorset. Uh, it's a typical modern wall-mounted LED floodlight. It cannot be pointed downwards. It shines sideways into neighbouring houses. It shines into the night sky. It dazzles oncoming drivers and people walking to the centre. It's an anti-light. Instead of revealing it, it conceals. You know, this is absolutely poor lighting at its very worst. If you're campaigning for, for better lights and, and more sensible lighting, have you had any successes so far? Are you actually getting this message through? Yes. I mean, uh, the Commission for Dark Skies has been in existence now for 25 years, and we've had quite a lot of success talking to uh, the Highways Agency, for example. Ever since the mid-90s, they will not put in a road light on a main road that shines upwards which is good. Nearly all the new LEDs, well, only there's... problem is they're mostly too bright for the job and they're very blue. And as we've heard, blue is not good if you live near a light. Well, let's certainly hope for darker skies in the future. Thank you very much. That's Thank Bob you. Meisen from the British Astronomical Association. As Bob has pointed out, there are many reasons to be stopping excess lighting and there have been some successes. But is it feasible to roll this out over large areas? Well, one community that reclaimed their night sky recently is in the South Downs, and Grown Jackson went to investigate. Just arrived at the Lewis Light Festival, and of course greeted by absolute pitch black, so much so that all my wires are tangled and I can't see what I'm doing. Good news though, it is a starry night and not a cloud in the sky, which hopefully means we should be able to do some good stargazing. But before I did any of that, I ran into Graham Festenstein. And I'm a lighting designer and I'm also the festival director for Lewis Light. From my perspective, our, our main thing is the glowworms. So we've been working with a scientist from Sussex University who's researching into the impact of artificial light on glowworms and that's inspired us to do this installation. This is when we walked through, there were a series of sort of hawthorn bushes and they've got lots of little green lights hanging yes. from them. That's right, yes, and the, the green we've, we've been working with Alan to, to look at uh, uh, developing these so they actually look, approximate uh, glowworms. But what we've done is we've put the light installation at the bottom of the hill 
And the idea here is to get people who maybe don't come out and do this kind of thing to come along, look at the lights, and then they can keep coming up here and then they can come and look at the other activities, the astronomy and uh, the, the, the bats and, and the moths and, and uh, come and enjoy, just enjoy being out in the darkness. It's funny because you never really think about going out to enjoy the darkness, do you? But I decided to face my fear of witches biting my toes off and head into the night to see what I could see. Does everyone hear that? Mm. Oh. So, picking up a so that's us finding our dinner if we're a bat. There are no bats, sadly. What you can hear is actually a demo. Further along, though, I finally found what I was after. Looking at the craters in the moon. The craters oh, like that. Yeah. Like a telescope yeah. looking up at the moon at the moment. <laughs> we just had it on the Andromeda Galaxy. That telescope's as big as the sort of cannon you might fire somebody out of. <laughs> the Light Festival's doing uh, dark sky friendly installations and all the things here are really low powered. And I think the moon's putting out more light than the, uh, the, the Light Festival at the moment. So right now it's fantastic. We've got you know, lots of people looking through the telescope and enjoying the sights of the, uh, the telescope of woe. Dan Oakley from the South Downs National Park, and he calls it the telescope of whoa, because, well, everyone who looks down it makes that noise of adoration. I joined the so-called moon queue, determined not to go whoa, but the first thing out of my mouth? Oh, wow. Classic. It's like the moon's got acne, <laughs> isn't it? Definitely get a much better idea of what Buzz Aldrin and... Everyone might have felt when they landed on the moon. Yeah. And I wasn't the only one enamoured. It looked fascinating. It just looked like a load of soap bubbles that popped on a, on a bar of soap. It was amazing. And I guess you've never seen the moon in that way before. No. No, absolutely not. It, it's not made of cheese. That's all I can say. <laughs> did you look as well? I did. And I thought it looked like cheese. <laughs> kind of Italian creamy gorgonzola cheese. <laughs> no wonder Wallace and Gromit wanted to go to the moon. <laughs> Just a glass of red wine, I'll be quite happy now. <laughs> cheese and wine party. Although the moon illuminated the landscape around us, it was clear to me that this would normally have been pretty darn dark. And that's even though we were right on the cusp of the park, where dark skies reach towns and cities. Behind me, it was pitch black, not a fleck of light on the horizon. In front of me, well, rays everywhere. But it was more than that. The cities glowed. They bathed the night sky with an aurora. And this is what Dan Oakley kind of set out to change. When we became a national park, part of that process was to consult with all the residents, talk about the qualities of the park. And one of those special qualities was uh, tranquility. Uh, and dark skies and so when we looked at our management plan we noticed that our skies were getting brighter um, so we decided to do something about it and start this dark skies project. So what classifies as a dark sky? To be classified as a dark sky you need to really be able to see the Milky Way with the naked eye uh, and the other good thing to see as well is the Andromeda galaxy if you can see those two things then they call that an intrinsic dark sky. You took something like was it 3,000 measurements over a few years every night Almost, it was more like 30,000. And the park is 1,600 square kilometres, plus the outside bits. That's quite a few nights. So we had a special sky quality monitor made up for us that could record at time interval. So we just set it at five seconds and I just drove around the downs and recorded it over the, all those nights and all those cold mornings. Are you naturally a night owl or was this a bit of a strain? Well, I, I, did, I thought I always was, but I, I really do think I am now. So I'll get, getting up in the morning is really difficult. It wasn't just about taking measurements, though, and saying, Bob's your uncle, we qualify, woo! Actually, Dan had to get the council on board to change their street lighting, too. Uh, well, they were coming to the end of all their street lights, so we all remember those horrible orange sodium lights, and they were really optically inefficient because they threw a lot of their light upwards, and that's that upward light that creates all the sky glow. So if you look at Lewis, you can see all that sky glow coming out now. When they did, came to doing the street lights, is they, they put up more optically efficient street lights which point the light downwards and because that light's not going upwards and, and uh, sideways means the sky gets better so you know a lot of, a lot of thanks goes to them really
It's a shame because the reason why I came here tonight was to hopefully see the Milky Way with the naked eye for the first time. Um, but alas, that's <laughs> it's not my night to be, I don't think. Because that's the idea of the Dark Skies Project, to be able to see the Milky Way with the naked eye, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, tonight, unfortunately, you, the whim of the weather and the moon. But um, when you can see the Milky Way, I mean, you know you're in a dark sky site and, you, and you, you, you'll you just smile when you see it. And if you go to some really dark places, you can start to make out some of the structure, some of the dark lanes, some of the dust. And, and that just elevates it even further because you, then you get a real sense you're in a galaxy. And that, you know, again, that feels like you're, you're looking at your house, your home in a real good way. Dan Oakley and Graham Festenstein there gazing into the dark with Greer Jackson. Have you ever seen the Milky Way, Cat? I have. I, I've certainly seen it here in the UK, but the most amazing stars I've ever seen was uh, I went backpacking with one of my sisters in the I Algonquin National Park. you were going to say I went Park. to a rock concert for a minute and uh, oh, no, saw no. Tina Turner or something. No, no, yeah. I went out backpacking in the Algonquin National Park in Canada with my sister and the stars were just incredible, except it was so cold we hardly got out of the tents at night. It's absolutely <laughs> freezing. Absolutely I, stunning. It's it's an amazing thing to see and, and we should we should bring it back. Now, hold on tight, because it's time for this week's Question of the Week, and Kirsten Gopfrick has an illuminating answer to this question we received from Matt. How can newly produced photons travel at the speed of light instantaneously without causing a force in the opposite direction? Why don't I get thrown backwards when I switch on my torch? To shed light onto this question, I dug out my torch and made my way to the Nanophotonics Centre in Cambridge, where I met with Dr Anna Lombardi. Anna, can light exert a force to move a physical object? Yes, definitely. According to Newton's second law of motion, a force is the mass of an object times its acceleration. But light is weird. It travels at constant speed, the speed of light. It never accelerates. In addition, light is made of photons, which don't have any mass. The crucial point is that, while light doesn't accelerate and doesn't have mass, it does carry a momentum. And momentum, as a form of energy, can be transferred. By transferring their momentum, photons are able to exert a force on an object. Physicists refer to it as an optical force. The higher the frequency of the light, the larger its momentum, and therefore the stronger the force it can exert. This means that blue light will push you stronger than red light. The theory tells us that light does have a little bit of a push, but I certainly cannot feel it when I switch on my torch. What's the point of all the theory then? While the push of light is so tiny that you don't feel it in everyday life, we can observe it at the nanoscale, in the world of the infinitely small. Arthur Ashkin, a scientist working at the Bell Labs in the 70s, demonstrated that nanometer and micron-sized particles can be accelerated, trapped and manipulated by the radiation pressure of a highly focused laser beam. Nowadays, scientists use light quite literally like optical tweezers to manipulate objects from cells to single atoms. Does that mean we just need a superpower torch to move the big stuff? If, as a light source, we don't limit ourselves to a simple torch, but we consider the sun, then the radiation pressure exerted is strong enough to push spacecraft and even asteroids from their path. So you better know the math when you plan your next mission to space. But Matt, I think we're safe to turn the torch back on. Thanks for your question and thank you, Anna, for the answer. And next time, we'll be answering Tim's question. If you start with a magnet with a north and south pole and break it into half, you get two separate magnets, each with their own north and south poles. So how does it know it's been broken? What causes the change? And where does it get the energy to do this? Ever decreasing magnets. I wonder how far you could go. If you've got an idea or if you've ever tried this experiment, do tell us. You can find us on Facebook, you can tweet at Naked Scientists, or you can look on our forum. There's loads and loads of questions, loads of answers there. Get stuck into the debate. Nakedscientist.com slash forum. Or you can email Chris at the naked scientist.com and that goes if you've got any questions that you'd like us to look into as well. And that's where we must leave it for this week. Thank you to all of our guests this week and also to producer Greg Jackson, who put the show together. Next week, we'll be delving into the science of horror. Why do we enjoy watching films that scare us? And could we make them even more frightening using neuroscience? The Naked Scientist comes to you from Cambridge University and it's supported by the STFC, the EPSLC and Rolls-Royce. Until next time, it's goodbye from me and from the rest of the Naked Scientists. Goodbye. <laughs>